The jury will not be sequestered. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. In the Weinstein case, fellow silence breakers and any selection is moving along here. I'll read the verdict says they Jesse Weber and thanks for joining us. We don't tend to see it as raw as this. Good evening and welcome. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. For the record, I'm Linda Kenny Bodden and I will be your host for the next three hours and what a show it's had we are having today. Let me tell you, we have three cases that we're following. Well, Nicholas Cruz is in the penalty phase. The jury will be back next week, but the defense has had a number of motions, including a motion to recuse the judge, which was denied. They also have two other motions to prevent the, def the state psychologist from appearing in their rebuttal case uh, for against them, which would be the state's uh, redirect case. And of course, then they also have another motion to not allow various swastikas or hate crimes or messages to come in. We'll see what the judge rules. She's expected to give a written ruling today. And when she does, we will let you know, of course. And we're also covering the case of George Wagner, the force out in Ohio. Sometimes you wouldn't know it because, you know, I've been on a rant about some law enforcement agencies who have not opted out They've not opted in to be in the courtroom. In other words, they're in the courtroom testifying, but we can't show them to you. But many members of the community are in that courtroom. Uh, the BCI agents have testified about the crime scene. The family members have testified. And yesterday we heard about something called Faro scans, which was most interesting. And this morning, the physician who performed the autopsy, and you know medical examiners, I'm married to one, uh, she was in the courtroom today, and we'll hear more about that crime scene evidence being explained later on. But right now, I want to take you right back in live into day five into the Alex Jones case. He was there today. He was outside the courtroom, not in the courtroom, but in the courtroom is where the interesting evidence is occurring. Uh, you know that Jones lost a lawsuit in Texas, arguing that the Sandy Hook families, uh, well, the Sandy Hook families, uh, they really weren't victims because their children really weren't dead, he said. Uh, he lost that case, almost $50 million awarded against him. Now we have eight various families, including an FBI agent here, who say they have suffered many damages, emotional torment, and they also have a Connecticut trade practices claim, which is very interesting against them. Brittany Paz, one of the corporate representatives, had been on the stand. Now Clint Watts, in the most interesting testimony, is on the stand. He followed al-Qaeda for the FBI. He knows when a social media platform is making things up or whether or not they're reaching their audience by what they say. You have to be bombastic. You have to be charismatic. Well, and you have to maybe be Alex Jones to get to a far audience. Far audience means more damages. Let's go into court and listen. And what is the role of time right. here as you're using it? Time is important uh, for changing people's perceptions or beliefs or selling uh, large volumes uh, of whatever your product might be. Because if you can do it over time, your results will be that more dramatic. People tend to believe that which they see the most, meaning that which is created by a content, a content uh, creator in high volumes, that which they're exposed to in high volumes, and that which occurs over the largest period of time. Uh, in, in terms of influencing human behavior, uh, and not how, so time works. Does that what does that mean in terms of that part of it? So time is essentially the longer you hear about something, the more likely you are to believe that you need to buy it, um, lease it, rent it if it's a product, or that it changes your perceptions about reality. If you're hearing it over and over again, audiences tend to challenge and, and ask themselves, "Well, if I keep hearing it." then it must be true. It creates the inverse. This has long been part of advertising, which is how, how much advertising did you do, how much do people see it, and how long do you endure with your campaign? So if, you, if somebody puts out one uh, statement, or, or fault, let's say somebody puts out one false narrative at one point in time, that can, that can do, can that do significant harm in and of itself? It can, but it has to reach a large audience. Okay. And if somebody repeats that over time, is it, is it, as an expert in this, uh, does that increase the risk exponentially? Yes. Okay. And does, does that also increase the efficacy of, for example, sales exponentially? Correct. Okay. Um, so I just, there's another part to this. Uh, I just want to get this done. Judge, thank you. I'm sorry. I was going to make just another bit of time here with a chart, and we'll get you back on the stand. But, um, uh, so we got to talk, can you just now talk about social media, the internet? Yes. Some people call it interwebs, the whole, and, and what, what, what their role is and what your experience is with that. So the internet, just at a high level, has really undergone two generations. The first generation is, I'll just call it the World Wide Web, 
which came about in the 1990s and really extended to about the mid 2000s. The World Wide Web was a pull system, meaning you had to pull content. You had to find it. And that's why you'll see oftentimes a magnifying glass when you go to the internet to search because you're trying to find content and then pull it to you. This was largely just internet websites um, that posted content there. Users would go, they either went direct to the website and typed it into the, the, to, the search in, uh, to the search bar, or they went to a search engine that you might be familiar with. Google, Bing, Yahoo, different search engines which then help you find the content so that you can pull that to you. The next era, which is really the second de decade of the internet, is social media. Social media, as I mentioned earlier, which I started uh, focusing on it, really started in the mid-2000s. I like to use 2005. That was when I started being exposed to social media in terms of YouTube. And that was different because now you had internet websites, which I'll draw here, where users can still pull content but now we had new social media websites that started up. I'll just name some of them. There are many of them now. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and there are many others. When this occurred, it allowed all of us as internet users to create our own persona, our own identity on the internet. And that changed how everything worked because instead of just pulling we could then subscribe to content and internet websites could post their content on each of these platforms. And when they do, your friends, your followers, your coworkers, everybody you know on a social media site, everyone that you friend, they can now push content to you, which is different. So as a consumer, you can have content pushed to you. You can then also go and pull content from websites here and then they can then repurpose, regenerate, and create content. So the key parts of social media are one, it's push, it's a push system where content gets delivered to you, but not always by the creator of the content. It could be somebody that you know. In this period, you find the content. In the social me media era, the content finds you. And um, has the social media, you, you were in the trenches, so to speak, in this area of evaluating uh, networks yes. uh, and the advent of the social media, uh, in the advent when social media was coming to its uh, current state, right? Correct. Um, and can you tell us what, if anything, that has done to the ability to disrupt disinformation and demonization and fear and anger, those kinds of things? It makes it much harder. If you had just an internet website, just the internet, Think of it as your home address in the digital world. People had to come to it to get things, to pull it. Nowadays, in the social media era, people can push it to each other. So even if this part went away, it's still hosted on those social media platforms. The social media platforms can then be subscribed to or viewed. It becomes much, much harder because the content creation becomes exponential, meaning it's not just one to one, one piece of content, one share. Now it's one to hundreds. It can take off on a life that's its own. You or I as users can take that content, clip it out, screenshot it, talk about it. We can send that to other people that we know. That creates an additional and just massive amount of distribution of content over time. So if a individual or an organization uh, or a corporation, for example, like Infowars, uh, had uh, effective messaging, an effective messenger, an effective medium, and an effect and uh, infrastructure, an effective method. Does social media does social media help those types of organizations uh, expand exponentially their message? Absolutely. If it's an effective message that engages with the, with the audience, in the second era, when the social media era came to bay the audience can then be a redistributor of that content.
And so the, the audience becomes a second, effectively a second messenger? That's right. You can enlist the audience as additional messengers. So over time, if you wanted to use the 4Ms and you were trying to reach, reach a wider and wider audience, for whatever your reason might be, you want to engage your audience in such a way that they also redistribute your content. They recruit other messengers that support what you are saying, whether it's about a product or it's about a belief system. Above that, you can receive information, tips and leads, or even donations or sales to help propel your infrastructure in your organization. All of those things help you sustain over time, and the more you can sustain, the more you can grow your audience. The more you grow your audience, the more you can challenge them and push your belief system on them. The more they change their beliefs, the more likely they are to undertake actions in the real world. Okay, and so, uh... Can you, is it, so can you trace certain uh, false narratives? Is there a ground zero? If somebody's a, let me withdraw the question, it's going off the rails. If there was an effective uh, message, effective messenger, and effective medium with an with a infrastructure of deep roots going back to, say, 9-11 and tens of millions of listeners, uh, that individual can affect secondary, tertiary, and what's four? Four. Something. Four. Four. For, it can affect everything down down the line, correct? Correct. And but for that, all these things, that narrative may never take hold, correct? Correct. Uh, this is what distinguishes an outsized influence, uh, a messenger with enormous uh, reach and enormous volume from just you or I or anybody who just holds up their phone and disseminates a message. Anyone can say a message, but does anyone hear it? Anyone can be a messenger, but does anyone pay attention? Anyone can produce content, but if it's not done well, if it's not done in a, a gripping and emotional way with video, it's probably not going to go very far. Just ask yourself, how many videos do you watch compared to how much you read? And last, if you can't repeat it over and over again, if you don't have the method down in terms of content creation, distribution, uh, uh, assessing what the effectiveness of it is, you won't endure over time. You'll largely be forgotten in the modern information space. And in peddling a false narrative, do messengers, effective messengers, uh, uh, utilize others, at, for example, for uh, roles as experts or anything like that? Yes. Whether it's a, a true or false piece of information and you're trying to expand the reach of that audience over time, or you want to lend credibility or presume credibility to a false message, you would enlist other messengers what would you look for? You would look for descriptors that would help add credence to it. So and maybe it's a, a, a school safety officer or somebody who worked as a professor or an institution. You would add those messengers there because they seem to have some sort of context related to whatever the message is. And just one more question before I'll ask you to resume the stand, which is, can you tell us and the jury what uh, role, if any, loyal, building loyalty and trust with, between the messenger and an audience of potentially tens of millions plays in this whole scheme. Okay, I want to introduce my two great guests today. We have Ann Bremner, $100 million. Ann Bremner won a verdict for her clients. Uh, she also has a book coming out, uh, Justice. I think it's in the age of judgment. Yes. And of course, uh, first time as a guest on Law and Crime, a, tr a true guest, commentating guest, Ben Chu. You saw him for months here on this network. Uh, he represented Johnny Depp so effectively, so wonderfully, so terrifically. Ben, I want to go to you. So we just heard from uh, Clint. Uh, Watts. He is a social media expert. He worked for the FBI. He said at one point that you have to have an effective messenger. And, and the reason why Jones could be an effective messenger, for instance, is uh, he was on Russian TV at one time. Uh, just like Russian TV, you can have a bogus claim. You can portray it as bogus, but you portray that Russian uh, threat or uh, a threat to the Russians, or as Alex Jones would say, other threats in America as bogus as existential, that it could take you out. So tell me, how does what he does on social media differ from what is happening in the courtroom in Connecticut as we are seeing it now? Ben Chu, the floor is yours. Linda, first of all, thank you so much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you and with Anne, who is, as you mentioned, an outstanding trial lawyer and author. I look forward to reading her book. Uh, the first notable difference I would mention is that Alex Jones ain't in Russia anymore. This is the United States, and where uh, lies which hurt people, especially heinous lies, horrific lies, 
uh, are not and have never been protected under the First Amendment. So the requirements of being an effective messenger uh, may conflict with one's legal obligations, and this is where the rubber hits the road. And Alex Jones is going to find out, as he found out in Texas, that the courtroom is a very different environment than uh, his uh, talk show. Uh, ben, you say it so well. Uh, yes, he will. And he has effective attorneys. or There are effective attorneys for the plaintiffs that are representing the plaintiffs in this, just like you were such an effective attorney for Johnny Depp. And thank you for flying those Ukrainian colors on your chair. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here on the way back. Uh, we'll be back into that courtroom. And Alex Jones and my guests will be talking to you about what is happening there. Stay with us. We are the Law and Crime Network. Plaintiffs in Waterbury, Connecticut, the backyard of the Sandy Hook school shooting where, as you know, 26 people lost their life. Alex Jones initially had called it a hoax, said the children were crisis actors, the parents were crisis actors. They hadn't really died. Well, right now in that Connecticut courtroom, the plaintiffs who are the parents of some of the children and one FBI agent are trying to show that Alex Jones has to come up with reality, he has to face reality, and that is the jury. Let's go into court and listen to Clinton Watts, who formerly worked for the FBI, talk about why Alex Jones can hawk uh, products, for instance, that are false or are false theories and get to an audience and make money. Bring uh, uh, consumers that information day after day. And is that, uh, did, would it matter then if in the first day that uh, Alex Jones went on the air was on December 14, 2012, would it have been an effective? How would that have affected? Yeah, it, his message uh, would not have been heard uh, because he wouldn't have had a time to build an audience. Uh, that's that time factor. Yes. Um, and does it take time to build trust in an audience? Yes. Okay. Um, and in terms of um, the, we'll just show what this looks like in numbers. talked about learning some information from Google Analytics to the extent that it was available, correct? Correct. Okay. So let's just show the uh, jury in numbers what we're talking about. What exhibit oh, is that's it? small. Uh, that, well, that's the... Uh, yeah. Mr. record here for looking at 120. Yeah, so this is the I, this is the front page. I guess this is rec. This is exhibit 120. Is that a full exhibit? 120 is a full exhibit, Your Honor. Um, Thank you. 210 must be another great exhibit. But um, can we go to Google Analytics and uh, and show the jury the analytics from 2012? So there we go. And if you could just sort of maybe blow up the year totals. Oops, oh, now I forgot the columns. Okay, so, so let's go to the top to orient on the columns first. So uh, sessions, um, so sessions, this is some measurement of how well they're doing with their audience or engaging their audience? Yes, that's the number of times uh, a, a user comes to the website. All right. Um, I'm going to need this. So we're on 2012. Attorney Paskoff. Yes, uh, sorry, Judge, I turned my back. No, I don't. Sorry. I'm worried about Attorney Pattis, not myself. You're, you're okay with that, Attorney Pattis? Not yet. You know, if, if Attorney Pattis, if it's, a, if it's a matter, I can just move it all the way back. Okay. Um. 
So sessions, I'm going to try to, I'll write large shares. I'm please. fine. 2012 sessions, 119 million, 107, 058. I'd like to start this chart over. With the court's permission. So sessions in 2012, 119 million, 107, of course everybody can read it, but 107,058, right? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now we have something called uh, users, and that is 49 million, 029. Correct. 313. And then we have page views. And that is 286 million. I'm just going to round it up because I'm running out of space. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now, this was, for the most part, the year, this is the infrastructure that was in place at the time of the Sandy Hook shooting on December 14, 2012, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, can you just, as somebody who's studied networks and spheres of influence, can you just describe to the jury the scale of what we're talking about? It's extremely large. Uh, compared to other organizations or, or entities that I've looked at, um, to achieve... I, I, I think the middle number is the one to focus on the 49 million to achieve 49 million users uh, in any given year is a, a massive audience. Was there anybody operating uh, in his, Alex Jones sphere of influence to your knowledge having studied this that came remotely close? Uh, no, I, I'm sure there was what, what would be mainstream sort of television channels or something that might have that. Uh, ESPN would have many more, for example, I would guess, but no, I'm not familiar with others. Okay. Um, and uh, in, certain, in fact, uh, we'll look at a, a media kits. A media, you can review media kits? Yes. And you've seen how he, uh, Alex Jones compares to what was presented as his competition? Correct. And he was on top by far, correct? He so, was. All right. Now, in terms of... Uh, so this is now... Is it, does this, do these numbers primarily capture what uh, the 2000, primarily capture the audience prior to Sandy Hook, given that Sandy Hook happened in the last two weeks of December? Yes. Okay. Now let's go to uh, 2013. Now we have 179. 324, 958, right? Yes. Um, how are you at math? I went to West Point. I can do it. Okay. Um, uh, and can you give us a ballpark of that increase? Uh, over one year, that would be roughly 70,000, you know, divided by 17. So a, a sizable number. You're talking about a, a sizable increase in audience, more than 50%. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cross examine you on your math skills, but, but do you know about percentage wise what this uh, bump is? Uh, it would be more than 50% audience share. Okay. And then users uh, goes from 49,000, sorry, 49 million to 73 million 237, 164. Correct. Another approximate uh, bump of 50%? About 50%, yes. Okay. And then page views, 427 million, 22 million. Is that another, <coughs> that's, not, that's another, uh, that's actually another almost exactly 50%, right? Well, correct. It's, it, it's slightly larger, but page views is the, uh, function of that multiple of pages per session, 
So prior to the Sandy Hook shooting, you were telling us about how uh, outsized his audi an audience he had, right? How large his reach was. Right? Correct. And how engaged they were in this uh, with his uh, with his presence online. Yes. Um, and did that already sizable uh, audience increase by approximately fifty percent according to Google Analytics? Yes. In, a year after? So in one year. Yes. Now, uh, the, uh, the jury has seen some videos of Alex Jones. We're not going to show all the videos. But um, um, so, uh, is it your, first of all, is this... Okay, I want to get my great attorney with me right now, Ben Chu, who won the Johnny Depp case we showed on this network. I remember being on the air when that verdict came over, 3.5 million of you are watching us as you are now today. Uh, ben, uh, this testimony is important for describing what a good host is. I, I may never make it. You have to be bombastic, charismatic, excited, but the bombastic part, yeah, I'm throwing that in the, in the toilet over there. But it's very important with the analytics, these analytics that are being shown. So tell me, sum up for me as if you were summing to the jury what the importance is of these numbers that we're seeing that the plaintiffs are producing. The importance, Linda, of these numbers is, as you have informed your viewers, liability has already been established. So what Chris Matty and his team are trying to establish are the damages numbers. And they, I think, are doing an excellent job showing the economics of how much money Infowars and Alex Jones were making on this and how systematic uh, it was. Um, analytics so I think that um, is imperative for him to show the nexus between the conduct and the actual numbers, because that's his real challenge. And I think it's coming through quite well. Clint Watts is a very effective communicator without being bombastic and without being untruthful. I think it's really coming through well, and it, it ties in well with what he said in his opening argument, which is the jury needs to send a message. In other words, the way to the best disinfectant for all of this disinformation coming out of Alex Jones and the Alex Joneses of the world is a huge jury verdict. That will shock the country. And it will make everyone take notice about the horrific lies, the unconscionable lies that have been told. So I, I think it's coming together masterfully. And I think Clint Watts is absolutely essential to uh, for plaintiffs to fulfill their burden. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely impressed with Clint with Mr. Maddie as, and his team, Chris Maddie and Clint Watts. And as you said, I can think of nothing more horrific, Ben, than saying that you've lost your first grader or second grader to gun violence when they went to school with their little notebooks off to school with their teachers. And, and somebody says, they're not dead and makes money off it. And the plaintiffs are trying to shock the conscience out of this jury to make sure, as you said, that the message is sent, that a large verdict gets awarded even if there's going to be trouble collecting it, something we'll talk about later on. Stay with us. We're looking at the Sandy Hook case. We have Ann Brebner, the author of uh, her new book, uh, Justice in the Age uh, of Judgment, and also Ben Chu of Johnny Depp fame with us. You won't want to mix what's on the other side. In Connecticut, in the Sandy Hook, Alex Jones case, as you know, the second one, because he lost the first one in Texas for nearly $50 million. The jury's coming back in. The judge had to take a five-minute recess because plaintiffs wanted to play a video. A Norm Pattis representing Alex Jones objected. The judge had to look at the video in chambers, so we don't know what her ruling is. I'll bring you back into the court when we know. But Ann Brebner, money, so much money. Video is king, and he is the king of video, Alex Jones, the plaintiffs are showing. Can the court system catch up, Ann? In in the day of the video, in the day of this type of technology, in the day of social media, can we catch up even if plaintiffs win? 
Uh, I don't know. I want to say first, though, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be on with the two best trial lawyers in this country, you. And oh, sweet. thank you. I mean, I'm like, you know, pinch me. It's just an amazing day. So I'm really humbled and grateful and honored. And I'm almost tongue-tied, but I'm not that much tongue-tied by it. I think that, um, I mean, we think about a billion dollars with a B. I mean, those kind of numbers that have been out there. And the fact that he's, there's this default case. So, you know, with punitive damages and everything else, it doesn't get much worse than Alex Jones in terms of what he did. Like we've talked about, grade school children, murder. Um, remember a teacher said to the kids they, they, that said Lonzo was like an animal, like, there's an animal. We have to get past this animal. You know, these kids are in grade school with their little backpacks and their notebooks, and they're murdered. And this man has the audacity, audacity to call it all a hoax, and then to make all that money off of it. I mean, this jury, I'm sure, is hopping mad like they were in Texas, and especially because they're in Connecticut right now. They're not even in Texas. Yeah, it's, and, and it's just awful. Uh, ben, let me go to you. Uh, I read before I came on the air, and I actually tweeted it, that here at thelawandcrime.com, we had to turn off our comments to this case, right? Uh, we didn't have to turn them off in the Johnny Depp case, which you had, because of the followers of Alex Jones. Doesn't that prove indirectly what the plaintiffs are saying in Connecticut, that once you get his followers, like, rabbited up, uh, that they go crazy and they were they follow these people around and, and, and really hurt them, not only saying their kids were dead, but also threatening them. At least we heard that in the Texas case. Your thoughts, Ben? Linda, I, I absolutely agree. Their reaction shows that what Alex Jones intended to do uh, had the foreseeable results. And I think that goes to Chris Maddy's burden of showing that uh, the liability, the tort here, the torts, uh, directly caused these damages and that they were eminently foreseeable and that it's actually what Alex Jones intended. This was kind of, this was the kind of result that he intended to achieve. And I have seen nothing to date where his counsel has tried to in any way mitigate Mr. Jones's responsibility. For example, mentioning that ha that this was horrific, mentioning that it was Mr. Lanza who fired the bullets, mentioning that uh, Alex Jones was not the one who manufactured the AR-15, but there's been no attempt to deflect or mitigate or to express any contrition or sadness about the event, which I think, Linda, just underscores what you and Anne said. This is just unconscionable, foreseeable, and intended. And I hope the jury really rings up the highest possible verdict here. And Bremner, let me go back to you. You have a book coming out, Justice in the Age of Judgment, in November, and you represented a family who's, uh, as we know, uh, not only can't find their loved one, their daughter, but lost all their grandchildren. Children in the courtroom and worth a lot of money, but they're never coming right. back. You're never coming back. So does Alex Jones play on that and say, you're making me the victim here. You're going after me because of something you can't have. Uh, you know, I have to plead guilty. I'm not the shooter. Does he, or are we making him a hero? Uh, no. In the case I had that you referred to, of course, were two children that were killed by their dad. And then we sued the state of Washington and the jury returned a verdict of $115 million. And it wasn't Josh Powell, the killer that was in the courtroom, it was CPS, Child Protective Services, and their failures to protect these kids. So take a look at this, you know, where we have Alex Jones out there compounding the damage and just ruining these people's lives. It's unbelievable to me that he got away with it for so long and he had followers, you know, co-conspirator type of conspiracy theorists out there glomming onto this and then coming back in and making comment, for example, at long crime, you know, this menacing, threatening, and everything else. It's just horrific. And the fact that it's not, he's not the killer, in a lot of ways he is. And he should be held accountable, like Ben said, exactly. All right, we're going to go back in the courtroom and we'll listen to what the Sandy Hook parents have to listen to as their plaintiff continues to present the they case. They are coming, attorney. they are coming, they are coming. You've seen that video before? Yes. Um, I want to ask you about uh, when you're when you're teaching uh, other uh, agents and investigators how to look into networks, tell me about message. 
Can you tell us um, what, if anything, uh, Alex Jones is employing here uh, that is in furtherance of what you've described to the jury? Uh, it's fear uh, over loss of weapons, uh, which he uses as the uh, justification. He stokes anger um, by repeating that it was some sort of a plot, and he uses demonization by picking a target uh, for his message as in what the perpetrator is or an existential threat to what they uh, uh, are are behind, uh, which he, in this case he says is taking weapons. And uh, in your career in intelligence and counterterrorism and the investigation of financial institutions, is this something you've seen before? Yes. Um, he talks about they. Um, they are coming, they are coming, they are coming. Uh, what, if anything, what is the significance of that, if, if anything, in terms of uh, its influence on an audience? Uh, it, it characterizes the situation as two parties, uh, us versus them, and, and that there is some sort of pending or current conflict that's underway. And um, is it, uh, he doesn't, does he, uh, in this case, he didn't um, identify who they were, is that right? Correct. He, he mentioned political figures at different times, but it, they is amorphous in the grand scheme of the video. And what is the value, if anything, about designating they or they versus more, being more specific about who's, who a messenger like this is talking about? Uh, using broad-based terms like they allows uh, over time, if you're going to message over time, to encapsulate a larger audience under that pronoun. And does it help stoke division, demonization, and anger and fear? Yes, it communicates to the audience that it, it's you or us uh, versus them or they. And does it help cement the bond between... This is all leading, Judge. Uh, what, if anything, does it do to the relation, relationship between the messenger, in this case Alex Jones, and his, his tens of millions of an audience? When communicated, particularly on social media, it creates a community around uh, this identity. Okay. And... Uh, and and in what if in any way does that uh, affect the the efficacy of, for example, pitching products? If you can identify with a product or a service, or it's part of what your what you believe your larger community or social circles with, you're more enticed to actually acquire that product. Okay. And uh, I'd like to now show the rest of. Oh, let, let me ask you a couple more questions. Well, actually, let's see the rest of the clip first. They've already taken over health care. The premiums are doubling. They're bankrupting that. They already shipped GM to China. They are going to gut this country. They're going to shut down the power plants. They're going to bankrupt us. They are re-educating us. Just like here, we, uh, we were Ukrainians, and they're Russians. They want us bankrupt. They want the counties and the cities bankrupted and federalized. The feds themselves run by globalists. What does my, what does the new magazine say? You can get it by subscribing. You get 12 issues, great way. This man wants your guns. And I, I break down here, they're declaring war on the Second Amendment, period. They are declaring war on the Second Amendment, period. They are coming after our Second Amendment. It is happening. They want to kill America in 2013. That is their goal. That is what they want. They are moving to do it. Send your tips uh, to Real Alex Shows on Twitter. Tell me what you think. Comment in the articles. I'll be reading what you're saying. We'll have more reports uh, Sunday, 4 to 6, and more reports tonight on the Nightly News, 7 o'clock, prisonplanet.tv. Okay. So in terms of the they again, he repeats the they, are we any more clear about who the they are? No. And what are globalists? It's uh, uh, basically a, a large, broad-based term that there is some sort of a global empire. Uh, it's never well-defined, and oftentimes characters move in and out of what is seen as globalist or belief in a global system. Okay. And uh, this would have been within about two or three hours of the shooting, and is Alex Jones attempt, uh, selling a product here as well? Yes, he offers subscriptions to the magazine during the broadcast. Uh, and what, if any, is the significance of him offering uh, something uh, for sale and for profit as he is sending a message of they are coming and, and they're going to take your guns and so forth? Uh, he's communicating that if you want to understand the phenomenon which he's talking about, it's a fear-based message based on anger and resentment and demonizing uh, a population, them. Um, the way to understand that is through his subscription. Okay.
Clinton Watts talking about how Alex Jones gets people to feel that the government or somebody, they, they, they are coming after you by fear, anger, demonization. And he went after the Sandy Hook families because the plaintiffs say that got him an audience and money. Stay with us on the other side. My guests, Ann Brebner and Ben Shu of Johnny Depp fame, will weigh in on the other side. See you then. Plaintiff's attorney for the Sandy Hook plaintiffs, most of them who lost children, one is also an FBI agent, hammering home that Alex Jones is trying to say that he is truthful when he's on the air, getting viewers by his demonization tactics. But in essence, he is causing a lot of harm to the plaintiffs. Let's go in and listen. Uh, documentary film, what is the purpose of that? Uh, it, uh, it both uh, spreads the message um, that a documentary filmmaker wants to make, and it also can increase sales if it's for sale. And if I'm not mistaken, if, uh, a, docu a feature film is a fictionalized account? Uh, so yes. And a, and a documentary is, uh, is a, a, a non What is a documentary? It tries to account for something that happened in the real world. OK. So it covers something that's true, actually happened? Correct. OK. And um, if we can go to the. Uh, second page of that, or the bottom, sorry. So, excuse me. Sorry. And you've reviewed this media kit before. Material, yes. Right? Okay. And this says, uh, topping the charts, kings of their domains. Uh, and what does that refer to? It means, the way I, I understand it, that uh, the platforms of free speech systems are at the top of the charts. And in terms of domains, that's websites. Domains usually refers to a website. Okay. And by the way, what is the purpose of a media kit like this? It's to entice uh, people to either broadcast or, or advertise. If it's a radio show, you might want to increase your syndication. If it's a website, it might be a way to rehost or sell products and services. So this is something that's used for commercial purposes to make money? Yes. And to increase the bottom line? Yes, it's promotional. Okay. And uh, when it comes to promoting InfoWars to advertisers, uh, InfoWars promoted their numbers, correct? Correct. And do you understand that those numbers came from... Do you understand whether... Sorry, I'll rephrase it. We try. Do you understand whether those numbers came from Google Analytics that they've told the court and jury uh, and us today that they didn't use? Okay, let me rephrase it. Do you understand whether those c c uh, numbers come from Google Analytics that they claim not to have ever used? Objection, compound, argumentative, leading. All right, so why don't we, it's almost lunch. Did I get it? Why don't we... Ben Chu, great attorney. We saw him on the Johnny Depp case here. You've been covering this with me for the last hour, and I know you have to leave me. But I want to get your final thoughts on the what is happening in that courtroom, in the well of that courtroom with the jury who's watching, because the plaintiff is saying, Alex Jones, he's not just a crazy lunatic. He's making a lot of money, and he knows it. What are your final thoughts, sir? My final thoughts uh, go back to jury selection, because as we had in the Depp case, uh, the plaintiffs need uh, all six jurors, so they had to be very careful, and I'm sure Chris Maddy and his team were, about uh, doing what they the best they could to ferret out any conspiracy theorists on the jury, uh, whether they be obviously you, you don't want any Infowars people, but you don't you, you're not really looking for Trump supporters or QAnon supporters either. Because remember, as you pointed out, Linda, one of the plaintiffs here is an FBI agent. There's a lot of anti-FBI nonsense going around. So I'm sure they were very careful on jury selection. Uh, what makes me encouraged is that uh, the Texas jury didn't have any problem coming back with a, a large verdict against Alex Jones. And, and, and doubtless, there were some conservative people on the jury. Obviously, what what Maddie and his team were looking for were parents, particularly women, but any parent. I'm, I'm a parent. And, uh, you know, the idea of these children having their uh, bodies torn beyond recognition and being told that they didn't exist 
is, is something hopefully that will transcend any kind of political lines and any juror uh, will be inflamed. Yeah, yeah, Ben, thank you so much for that because I know there's mention of politics in the courtroom that Trump, the judge accidentally used the word Trump in passing as uh, Mr. Pattis was talking about politics. Uh, so we want this case to be about the victims here. And I really hope uh, you who have represented victims can show us, come before us again, and give us your thoughts in the future. Thank you, Ben Chu. On the other side, Ann Bremner, Jean Rossi, stay with us.